Hey, welcome back to another video. So when it comes to the type of videos and content that I make on this channel, one of the things I want to do is place a bigger focus on practical engineering. Whether you're an engineering student or just a hobbyist at home who'd like to start making their own customized projects, the videos I'll be making should be very helpful. Many of these projects will involve motors and automation, reading sensor data, and other engineering concepts, which means I'll also be talking a lot about microcontrollers, embedded devices, and single board computers. That's why for today's video, I thought it would be a good idea to give a general overview on microcontrollers and the sort of applications they can be found in, and also explain the differences when compared to single board computers, or SBCs for short. So as we all know, computers have revolutionized society and they can be found in just about everything these days. Even before the recent trend of smart devices, most electronics from the past few decades have had some sort of computer chip in them. For example, coffee makers, thermostats, CO2 monitors, cordless phones, and TVs are just a few examples of devices in your home with a small computer that falls into the category known as an embedded system. These are also found in larger and more complex applications including robots, vehicles, traffic lights, factory assembly lines, subsystems and power plants, and well, to be honest, pretty much everything these days. Embedded systems can be defined as a small computer with hardware designed for a very specific task. At the heart of many embedded systems is what's called a microcontroller, or MCU for short. Microcontrollers can be thought of as a low-cost, self-contained computer, but these aren't the same type of CPUs that are found in your laptop or desktop computer. Those are referred to as microprocessors and are designed for general purpose and high-performance computing with an operating system. Microcontrollers, on the other hand, are usually designed to run a single program for a single task in most cases, which makes them simpler overall and easier to work with. These programs are usually written in assembly language or C, although some microcontrollers are capable of running C++ programs or MicroPython. A typical microcontroller contains a CPU that runs between a few megahertz and a few hundred megahertz. And as far as memory goes, they typically range anywhere from a few hundred kilobytes up to several megabytes. But despite these underwhelming specs compared to a microprocessor, microcontrollers still have their place in a huge number of applications. In fact, most systems that contain a full processor will have a number of microcontrollers on the board to handle various subsystems. So in some cases, microcontrollers can be thought of as a coprocessor that's meant to handle certain tasks and communicate that information back to the main processor. They're not bogged down by an OS in most cases, which is important for time-critical applications. They also contain special peripherals such as clocks and timers, PWM modules, comparators, ADCs, and DACs, just to name a few. These peripherals are tools that help with analog and digital signal processing. This includes conditioning incoming signals from other parts of the PCB so they can be properly interpreted, or generating its own signals to control other hardware and peripherals. They also feature various communications interfaces, such as UART, I2C, SPI, and more, in order to share information with a processor or other microcontrollers. So now let's talk more about some examples where you'd find microcontrollers and how they're used. I'll first start out with a regular PC motherboard. So as we all know, the CPU is at the heart of a motherboard, but there are a number of subsystems on the board that aren't controlled directly by the CPU. For example, let's start with the VRM section. These are a collection of MOSFETs and other components whose job is to regulate the power going into the CPU and RAM. The VRMs need to be able to measure the voltage and current of several different power rails, and also be able to control the voltage and current of these rails. But it turns out the CPU itself isn't controlling the VRM, but rather one or more microcontrollers are handling these functions. 
The same goes for other parts of the motherboard. For example, the Southbridge chipset is usually a microcontroller that handles a number of things, including PCIe, SATA ports, Ethernet, audio, and more, and communicates all this information back to the CPU. Most motherboards will probably have several additional controllers to handle these sort of tasks I just mentioned as well. Also, pretty much every peripheral will have their own microcontrollers too. For example, graphics cards will have several of them to handle various things including the card's voltage regulation and fan control. Other components such as hard drives will have at least one microcontroller as well, and even your USB mouse will have one too. Now let's take a look at a different example, one where there's no processor present, but only a single microcontroller. Here's a general block diagram of the different parts you might find in a basic digital thermostat. As you can imagine, one of the most important parts in a thermostat is a temperature sensor, which is connected to the microcontroller at the center here. You'll also have some sort of controls, such as a dial so you can set your desired temperature range. The controls and the temperature sensor are the two inputs of the system, while the air conditioner or the heater are the outputs. The microcontroller's job is to read the inputs and decide how to control the outputs. It's only capable of running this one program that was coded into it, and if you wanted to change its functions then this program will need to be erased before uploading the new program. Your thermostat might also have a digital display to show relevant information which can be considered an output and is also controlled by the microcontroller. And of course, there will probably be circuitry for power regulation represented by this block. This is just a simple example, but if you were to look at a more complex example such as a car, something like that is actually just a collection of smaller subsystems such as this one. So now let's use a car as an example. And let's say it's a car from around 2010, before all the smart features started becoming standard. Cars come equipped with a heater and air conditioner, which means they'll also have their own thermostat similar to this one. But cars have quite a few other systems as well, and typically each of those systems will have at least one dedicated microcontroller. For example, there will be a controller that manages all the locks on the doors. It will have an RF receiver that detects when you push the button on your fob to lock or unlock the car. This receiver is connected as an input to the microcontroller, and each of the individual locks on the doors are treated as a separate output. Another example is the system that controls the timings of each spark plug in the engine, or the system that monitors the air pressure in each tire and turns on a warning light if it detects low pressure in any of them. A typical car will have dozens of these subsystems, each of which has its own microcontroller that manages its operations. In many cases, a single microcontroller can handle a few different subsystems, but the point is, you're guaranteed to find quite a few of these chips in a typical car. Now let's take a look at some popular microcontrollers that are on the market. A few notable examples are the STM32 series developed by ST Microelectronics, the PIC series developed by Microchip, the AVR series developed by Atmel, which was acquired by Microchip several years ago, and the ESP32 and ESP8266 lines of microcontrollers. There's quite a few other brands on the market, but these are some of the more popular ones. Depending on the specs and features, some of them can be purchased for as little as 50 cents each, but most of them will cost several dollars, and this is just for the chip. Many of these can also be purchased with a development board, which is a good place to start if you want to get into embedded systems, since it contains everything you need to start programming and using it for a project. The Arduino is probably the most popular development board and is useful for people who want a simple, low-cost board to learn basic concepts with. It contains an 8-bit AVR microcontroller and is also available in different sizes including this nano board. If you want something more powerful, then the STM32 Blue Pill board can be found on eBay for around $10-15 to $15 these days. 
Its 32-bit CPU makes it much more capable than the Arduino. Another great choice and one of the more modern options is the Raspberry Pi Pico. I plan to make some videos about the Pico because it's an extremely capable microcontroller and is available for only $4, which makes it an incredible value for the money. The Pico is quite different compared to the full-sized Raspberry Pi though, because traditionally the Raspberry Pi fell into a category known as the single board computer. Now like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, the term embedded system is a very general term and can apply to any system that's designed to perform a specific task as opposed to a general purpose computer such as a desktop. Generally an embedded system contains a microcontroller at its core, but not always, and sometimes they contain a full processor, in which case they're commonly referred to as a single board computer, or SBC for short. The best way to describe an SBC is a hybrid between a regular PC and a microcontroller. They typically contain a powerful ARM-based microprocessor that's meant to run a full-blown operating system such as Linux. But at the same time, they come in a small form factor and also contain general purpose I.O. pins, which is something a normal desktop or laptop PC lacks. This means an SBC can interact with sensors and hardware in the same way that a microcontroller can. But sometimes there still are some limitations. For example, the full-size Raspberry Pi does not come with an analog-to-digital converter, commonly referred to as an ADC, which is a feature that almost every microcontroller comes with, including the $4 Raspberry Pi Pico. Also, SBCs are typically a lot more power-hungry than microcontrollers are, so if you're designing a system for a battery-powered application where power efficiency is important, then you should probably stick with a basic microcontroller unless you absolutely need the processing power from an SBC. The Raspberry Pi was one of the first SBCs to become popular, but these days there's quite a few options on the market. Some notable examples include Le Potato as a budget option, which comes from the Libre computer boards, the Orange Pi series of boards, and NVIDIA's Jetson Nano, which comes equipped with a GPU allowing it to run CUDA programs for AI applications. I've actually spent a lot of time with the Jetson Nano in the past, and it's at the heart of this custom robot I designed and built myself. I plan to make more videos about this robot in the future, so stay tuned for that. But the Jetson Nano isn't the only SBC that can run AI applications. This model from Orange Pi contains specialized hardware meant for AI acceleration. And as AI becomes more mainstream in the upcoming years, I imagine we'll be seeing a lot more competition among SBCs like this with dedicated hardware for AI. Also, it's worth noting that Intel and AMD have also entered the embedded systems market. And I imagine we'll be seeing plenty more SBCs with these chips as well. So hopefully you now have a better understanding of what microcontrollers and SBCs are and how to use them. Like I mentioned earlier, I'll be placing a bigger focus on practical engineering. So if you're interested in learning more about electronics, software, or how to design your own systems, then consider subscribing to the channel and hit the bell icon so you can get notified when new videos come out. Also, if you found this video interesting, then be sure to give it a thumbs up and if you have any questions, then feel free to drop a comment. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.